Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Eaglin coming to you from Daytona State College, and this is CEN 3722, Human Computer Interaction, and today we're going to talk about the field of human factors. So what we really want to do today is get a good understanding of the field of human factors because it's an entire discipline. There are complete majors in the field of human, in the field of human factors. We're going to look at the con, one of the primary concepts of human factors called allocation of function because human factors is really dealing with the human element of every single human to machine interaction. So look around you and look at all the different types of machines that you work with and understand that human factors engineering or human factors is that human side of that field. We're going to look at the concept of anthropometry, which is essentially the human side and human measurement. And even though this is not a statistics class, we are going to look at the statistics that we need to do when we're dealing with human factors and human factors engineering. And how do you deal with when you take anthropometric measurements, how do you use them? How do you work with them? So first, let's just look at human factors. And this is often called human factors engineering. So you're going to hear it underneath both titles. And I'm usually going to call it human factors engineering because I do actually think of this as a complete engineering field. HCI, which is the class that you're taking, is actually a subset of human factors, as is ergonomics, which we're going to talk about a little bit later too. But the goal of human factors, okay, in dealing with machine-man interactions and that, that man part, that human part of machine interactions, is to look at things like reducing the error rate of working with machines or increasing the productivity of people or an entire field. It, it encompasses the entire field of human safety and also the field of comfort. So uh, we're going to see some of this. Now, it is an engineering field. And as an engineering field, it follows the engineering process, the process of identifying problems and generating solutions to the problems. So in the field of engineering, we are used to this concept. You take a problem, you break it down, you look at various types of solutions, you rank the solutions, and you pick the best solution. And this field is no different than those fields. So let's look a little bit at uh, machine, human machine systems. Well, we interact with machines. A person may interact with a machine. Multiple people may interact with a machine. You interact with a machine in a specific environment, and you have specific goals that you want to achieve in this interaction. What we are trying to do with human factors engineering is optimize that interaction. The optimization is based on the goals that you set forth when you actually design these man-machine systems. So when you create a machine, the machine has something that has a purpose. A human working in that machine is trying to achieve a goal, and we are looking for optimization of that entire system. So human factors engineering does encompass the system. Even though it does not really get into the guts of the machine design, it is in the portion of the machine design that deals with its interface with the human. So that is a very important distinction. So this model that we are using here is a very common model. We've looked at this model from both sides. The model on the human side where you have perception and action and you have it from the machine side which shows that the machine does something, it has a set of controls, it displays information back to the user which becomes the input to the user which then produces an action. When doing human factors engineering, you first design for the set of goals. So whether we're doing UI design or just standard HCI design or something that's very specific in the human factors field or just looking at human factors as a general field, you still say, we are going to set forth the goals of the system. Goals allow you to actually achieve design that meets those goals. If you don't ever set the goals, you don't do that. So let's look at some goals. The thing about goals is, is that you can have lots of different goals that you're trying to do when you're designing a system. So in this case, our goals that we're looking at, we can prioritize, let's say we're looking at a set of goals, and then let's try to prioritize them. So let's take this set of goals here. Speedy service, frequent mail delivery, delivery to all homes, low cost, guaranteed transit time. Well, by looking at those goals, you can probably just look at the, decide, hey, you know what, they're probably talking about a system to do delivery. 
Well, that's a huge system. A lot of people have a very strong vested stake in optimizing delivery systems. Amazon, the mail, the US Postal Service, all of these are large organizations that would like to optimize this entire arrangement. And the arrangement is more than humans or machines or trucks. It's a full system, so full system op optimization. So if you are an engineer, let's go back to being an engineer. As an engineer, you don't like ambiguity. So when you look at the goals that you've set for yourself, if there's any level of ambiguity in those goals, you want to remove that ambiguity. What this means is, when we say speedy service, well, what is speedy service? Does speedy service mean that you get it the same day? Or is two days good enough? Speedy service may mean within the next half hour. So you need to remove that ambiguity. And in that case, with the ambiguity gone, you can design for that specific set of goals. Now, engineering is a field that sets goals, does design, and also operates within a series of constraints. And we have to do that. But as you're setting the goals, you'd establish metrics for each of the individual goals that you're establishing for the system. Many of those goals are going to fall within the field of the human factor side or that man-machine interface. We know, anybody that's done any type of engineering works knows that you fall within constraints. Design, goals, and constraints are the big factors in engineering design. For an example, and this is a good example, if you're trying to deliver speedy service to the entire population of the United States, it's going to come at an expense of some other goal. Typically, that goal is going to be cost. And what this means is, if we were trying to hit, let's say, 85% of the population, you might be able to deliver it for 22 cents a letter and still make money. If you're trying to go for 95% of the population, that cost may skyrocket to 45 cents from the 22 cents, literally go more than double. The reason being is that rural customers are much more expensive to deliver to than urban customers. And as you get out to those large, small rural communities that are where it costs a lot more to get mail delivery to, you lose that. Now, you can also change the parameters. You can say, we would like to get two-day service to 85% of the population and three-day service to the remaining, you know, the next 10%. That changes the goals, changes the parameters, and changes the design. Now let's look at allocation of function. You have to make decisions as a designer. And when we talk about those decisions, we have to say, we're going to be designing man and machine systems and what we need to do is we need to make the decision of what tasks go to the machine, what tasks go to the man, and how do we put the interface in there? When I mean man, I mean any, any user. Machines are good at a lot of things. Humans are good at a lot of things too. Many of the things that machines are good at are things that humans are not and vice versa, which really does help in the design. So, Machines have very reliable memory. In fact, they have perfect memory, and they don't typically get tired. They may need to be fueled up, but they're not going to go and need sleep, except some machines do actually need downtime, but downtime is usually just repair time, you know, time for humans to come in and do some sort of repair. Humans, on the other hand, are very good at creative tasks. One thing that humans do extremely well is they fail well. Machines often fail catastrophically, and humans don't typically fail catastrophically. They typically recover fairly well. And that's something that's extremely important in designing safe systems and systems that can actually handle adverse or conditions that are not, let's say, less than optimal. We're going to kind of explore this in many case studies in this lecture and upcoming lectures to, to see what I mean there. Humans also have the ability to learn. Even though there's a field of machine learning, machines do not learn like humans do. Machines can take something that is a failure, come back, 
completely analyze it and develop systems that get you past that next set of failure, which is why over time we've developed extremely reliable engineered systems. Many systems today that you don't even think about, you go out and you get in your car and you start the ignition and it works almost 100% of the time. There was a time when that was a pretty iffy thing. You go to the car and it might just be happy enough to start for you. Anybody who has a really old car can re recall this. Okay. Why? Well, because we've learned from the failures of the past engineering failures, and we've, we've you know, as humans, we have figured out better ways to do that. It was a machine that did that. We designed those machines. So in the field of allocation of function, remember, going back to allocation of function, what does the machine do? What does the human do? Well, as a designer, we would like to give as many tasks as possible over to the machine. Machines are very reliable. They do things very well. They don't necessarily, they can get overloaded, but they don't typically get overloaded. Humans get overloaded relatively easily. So we also have the possibility in humans of underloading them, which is another issue that you actually face in the world of human factors. But because of machine reliability, that giving those things, those tasks to the machine is something that you want to do. Now, we can let the user decide what allocation of function we give to the machine. A good example of this is simply cruise control or autopilot in planes. You don't want to deal with you know, trying to keep the car at a constant speed. You've got good old cruise control. And what you're doing is an allocation of function. You're giving over some control of the machine to the machine, to the, to the cruise control system. And it keeps the car at a constant speed. Cruise control systems have been around long enough that they're very, very safe. They have the ability to switch back to human operation very rapidly, you know, just a tap of the brake. So this is a good system to use as an example of allocation of function that is a mature system. Now, this is going to require, as you're doing this, this is going to require a full systematic approach of how you work on this allocation of function. So we're going to look at the systematic approach to design. There is a methodology. You look at the machine system. You look at the human system. You look at the advantages of what the machine can do, the advantages of what the human can do. You can look at your interface constraints and deal with all the other constraints that you've got in design, such as financial constraints. And you say, if we move this allocation, we allocate this function from the user to the machine, what does the machine have to be capable of doing? If we take this task and allocate it to the user, what does the user have to do? And what are the other things that the user is going to be doing? So it is a full systematic process of design, looking at each aspect of the design and making those decisions. It's not just random and haphazard. Let's look at some case studies, some fun ones here. And one of, my, one of the fun case studies is the first Japanese car to be sold in America. And if anybody, you know, good trivia question, what company sold the first Japanese car to be sold in America? And that would be Toyota. And Toyota introduced the Toyopet. It's called the Toyopet Crown. It actually was a pretty interesting car. It was, it was a good car, had some limitations and constraints. One of the things that the Japanese designers did not take into account very well was the difference in body size and body mass of the average Japanese driver versus the average American driver. So we had issues where tall or large American drivers simply could not uh, do two things. One is fit in the car very well, but the other one was is that the gas pedal and the brake pedal were too close together, so anyone with a large foot had a very difficult time hitting the gas or the brake, and it was very common to kind of switch over from one to the other. The other thing that they did do in this first introduction is Japanese driving was typically, the Toyopet was designed primarily for urban driving and usually at low speeds. And I mean low speeds is 20 to 40 miles per hour. If you took the Toyopet on the interstate for any extended period of time, because the car's mechanical design was for one set of systems, systems 
it didn't do very well in the other system, which was highway driving, and you would destroy the engine by taking it on the interstate for a long trip. Of course, those weren't things that worked very well. Right, that's, a, that's a case study, and we're going to look at some of these case studies and start delving into what is what, what was done wrong, what was not considered, what engineering science could have been there to solve many of these problems. I'm going to give you another case study, and this is a telecoms case study. And in the early days, days of telecom, we needed to be able to create pre-recorded messages. And the pre-recorded messages, the design was that the people that were doing, that were using the system, which in this case were essentially the secretarial staff of large corporations, would be the ones that would design the pre-recorded message systems. This was going to be a huge advance. A group of computer scientists were hired, and they developed a very elegant language for the ability to create these messages, and they sent it out into the real world. Well, it didn't work. It didn't work at all because the people that were going to be designing this background were not computer scientists, and they did not have programming languages as part of their, their education. They did not understand procedural, the way procedural languages work in programming, and because of all that, it, it just did not work at all. Not understanding the actual user that was going to be using the system itself was the flaw here. Now, let's get a little bit more into the field of ergonomics, which I'm going to cover in depth in another, language, another lecture. But we're going to start into one of the favorite topics of anthropometry, or anthropometry, if you like to say it that way. But that is essentially the study of the dynamics and static measurements of the human body. How do humans fit into a machine environment? And it's really essentially what it is. And of course, this is not as simple as saying a human is five foot 10 and 160 pounds because all humans are different. So we've got, it becomes a very rich field and it is a field that deals a lot with statistical design. Two portions of anthropometry, Static measurements and dynamic measurements. And static measurements are exactly what they say that they are. A person's height, a person's weight, the distance between a person's elbow and a person's wrist, okay, the difference between the level of a person's neck and a person's eyes. Those are all anthropometric measurements that can be used in system design and are used in systems design. Dynamic measurements are those measurements of how far can a person bend over? Of course, how far can they bend over without getting back strain? If they have to reach and grab something, how far on average can a person reach and grab? How much weight can they hold for a specific period of time and then dynamically move it from point A to point B? Those are also anthropometric measurements, which are dynamic measurements. And the field of anthropometry deals with both of those. Now, to do anthropometry, we've got to deal a little bit with statistics. And this is the two-minute statistic lecture. First, statistics, you cannot go out and measure the entire population of somebody that's going to use your device. If you're designing a car, you're literally not going to go out and measure the anthropometric measurements of everybody who's going to drive that car. So we get into something in statistics called sampling theory. When we take a representative sample of people, and then we take that representative sample and we abstract it to the entire population. So you get into what are populations and you know, the full population and the representative sample of that. Also, you've got things called descriptive statistics. In other words, what are you going to measure that you can get a numerical measure on? What is the average weight of a human in the US? What is the average weight of a male or a female? What is the mean of the people that are in a specific area? Essentially looking at your users and the standard deviations. How much do they vary? I mean, do they vary? And you can look at the range. These are all descriptive statistics. So in the field of statistics, you've got things that are called st uh, descriptive statistics. One of the ones that we use a lot in anthropometry is the concept of the percentile. 
And the percentile is something that's really straightforward. It's not hard at all. You can say that 5% of people are over X weight, uh, you know, say 250 pounds. Okay, that is a descriptive, which means that 95% are below. Okay, that percentile can tell you a lot because when you're making, when you're designing something, you're designing for a group of people that are all going to fit within a specific range. So to give you some idea of how this works, just some simple pictures. This is a normal distribution. It's got a mean and a standard deviation. It's the most common distribution you deal with. Many things fit a normal distribution. And if you're dealing with a percentile, in a normal distribution, 5%, if you say a 5% percentile, what you're saying is that 5% of the people in this normal distribution for this descriptive statistic are less than the number. You can say the same thing on the other side. 95% of the people for this descriptive, of the population for this descriptive statistic are less than this value. That's the 95% potent, uh, and that's simply it. The 95 percentile is 95% or less, which means that 5% or more. And you can flip it around, okay? Just look at it in a totally different perspective. So when you're dealing, let's say, with a specific statistic like the weight in men, if the mean was 150 and the 5% was 75 and the 95% was 250, what you're saying is that the average of the weight of all the men is 150, the mean. 5% of the men in the sample or in the population will be less than 75 pounds, where 95% of the men would be less than 250 pounds. Okay, now we've got a design for this. When you're designing in the world of human factors and you're designing for the human, you've got to design for these statistics. And you can design for the average, you can design for an extreme, or you can look at a range of, for design. So designing for the average is really tr challenging, but of many things you do have to design for the average. Let's say a fixed height chair or a desk or a countertop. It's very difficult to design countertops that can move up and down. It's very difficult to design for many different types of heights. So we essentially design for the average. Like in countertops in the U.S. Design, are designed to be three feet off the ground. You can get them higher than three feet off the ground or four feet off the ground, or three feet off the ground or lower, but it's a custom job. We just deal with that as being the average. So there are plenty of things that are designed for the average. We also design for the extreme. Um, something like a doorway. You wouldn't want to design a doorway for the average user. So we say that, okay, everybody that is, a, let's say, 5 foot 10, no problems, don't need to duck. But everybody that's above 5 foot 10 needs to duck going through the doorways. We're going to have a lot of sore foreheads. You design for the taller individuals. And then essentially, you're eventually going to find uh, people that are taller than that that are going to have a hard time getting through that doorway. They're going to have to duck. But if you design, let's say, for the 95% or the 97%, and those are also standardized. You go to the store to buy a door. Ooh, you, <laughs> the doors are all essentially the same height. Doorways are all essentially the same height. They're designed for an extreme, the extreme individual, not the upper level of the extreme, but just, just the median extreme. So the 95 percentile is what we're looking at. Same thing, you can design for even more extremes. Let's say you're not designing a door, you're designing a ladder. A ladder, you want to make sure that it's safe underneath almost all conditions. You may design now for at least a further out, the 99th percentile, so that the ladder doesn't break, but would break if somebody over a certain weight were to get on the ladder. The ladder has to maintain a specific type of weight. So we don't want to have problems there. The other thing that you can do in the design is allow for a level of adjustment. Many things are adjustable. Car seats and cars are adjustable. You can move the car seat back, you can move the car seat up, you can change the elevation. Adjustable means that you can design for a much larger range of humans and the anthropometric, anthropomet, <laughs> anthropometric statistics involved. So, after all of this is all said and done, I had just covered essentially an entire field of engineering, which has its own degree, 
very slightly, just a little bit over the surface. But what we've done is we've looked at what is human factors? What is human factors engineering? What is allocation of function? What is anthropometric data? What are some basic statistics that are used in anthropometric data? What do we mean by descriptive statistics? What descriptive statistics do we use and how can we use them? And finally, what are the different ways that you can approach dealing with anthropometric data? So this is a whole lot. We're going to look at some of the areas of human factors in a little bit more depth because there's a lot of depth associated with human factors. But this broad overview should give you a good view of what is human factors and how does human factors affect you when you're doing design of human computer interfaces in the field of HCI. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Ron England signing out from Daytona State College and got some really good lectures coming up for you.